so much. So thank you for coming. This is our seventh lecture. And um, the last time we derived what I think is, um, is a very important result that if neural responses are given by a logistic function of this, um, um, of a function of a stimulus, then uh, the model has an information preserving population vector or a readout, and it is given by um, this expression. It's the average uh, of whether the neuron produced a spike or not. It's a preferred fill, oh, sorry. It's preferred um, um, feature or a receptive field or place field. And here I specifically highlighted this uh, scaling vector beta i, but last time they were incorporated in the definition of the vector w. So now, um, in the first part of the lecture today, I will go over the implication of this um, derivation and how it differs from the standard population vector and what is a popu standard population vector. So in the standard population vector, even though the neural responses depend on this, um, so let's think about what, what happens with this factor beta. If beta is large, then um, we have a very steep nonlinearity. Uh, maybe, Angela, maybe, d d would you mind drawing this? Uh, the, no, uh, sorry, the, the line? Yeah, so yes. I think it would be if, um, yeah, somehow I cannot comment um, or ah. annotate on my, so I will. Um, we, just, uh, we just see the, um, the arrow, the pointer. Yeah, the arrow, yeah, so I will trace it with an arrow and if you can record it on the blackboard, I think that would be good. So as a function of this product wi and s, in this case wi is normalized, the unit length, uh, this function looks like this, it's a sigmoid like that. Should I? Yeah, if you can draw it on the black. Ah, okay. Uh. Apples, so the short form is apples. Good. Uh, number two, we. Would you mind? Can we, can we mute you? Can we mute somebody? Yes, someone, some, someone is. No, I, I'm muted, so. Um, so should I draw this uh, SIG model, right? Yes, thank you. Uh, so so it can go between zero and one. Should be like something so like it that, right? Like this. Yeah, thank you so much. And now, if um, so, this is for some kind of a standard beta, but if beta is very large, it becomes a step function. So it should be like this, right? Yes. And if beta is um, smaller, then it will be more shallow. Yeah, so like that. So, in principle, um, in the yesterday's uh, last time presentation, the, the WI were not normalized and this beta factor was incorporated into the definition of W. And the reason I am um, separating them is because you can think of beta I as noise in a neuron. So a neuron with um, large beta will have smaller noise and neurons with uh, um, small beta will have large noise. So beta is, um, it, as in physics, is like one over kT. So maybe, Angela, if you can write down beta as one over kT, then for oh. um, physics students, um, it will um, make a connection with, with statistical physics. So, um, and why we go over this in uh, more detail is because um, in uh, neuroscience literature, 
this factor was not taken to in, into account, even though it is um, um, they re even though the expression that they used was similar, except for that factor uh, beta, and we will go over the consequences of this. So, uh, way back when, in 1986, Georgiopoulos um, empirically observed that a procedure um, that you know, it was an empirical observation, so they didn't have a derivation, so they missed the beta factor. But um, that, that was their procedure, and empirically it was observed that it works very well for, as a measure of readout of neural activity. So how is it done in practice? So in their case, they were thinking about modern neurons. So neurons whose spikes um, encode movement, movement of a hand. So in this case, uh, the example neuron, this is just one neuron, and its characterization is shown on the right. So the animal, the, the monkey is making various movements like this. And uh, so it can make, um, if it makes the movement down to the left or to the right on the screen, then there is lots of spikes from that neuron. And when it makes a movement in the opposite direction, then there are much fewer spikes. So each little tick is a spike, and uh, each movement is repeated 10 times, so you can see variability across multiple trials. So as a result of experiment for one neuron, you can draw a vector, a preferred vector, W, for that neuron, which will be somewhere down to the bottom. And so by studying that neuron in isolation, we can assign to it just one vector, W, and that characterizes its ideal direction to which it produces most response, uh, most spikes when the animal moves in that direction. So on the right, we have a picture for one neuron and many, many experiments to characterize just one neuron. But once we obtain this characterization, we can characterize the whole movement that the animal makes by monitoring many neurons. So for each neuron, after the detailed study of that neuron, we get WI. So this is obtained for each neuron across many, many um, separate experiments. But now you're monitoring in real time. So the WI unknown, and what is known across multiple neurons is whether or not it produced a spike or not. And a spike is denoted here as one, and the absence of a spike is minus one. So both spikes and no spikes matter. So if um, the... Um, if this neuron, if the movement was in this direction, so it's like the neuron, when it's not producing a spike, it's voting for a direction opposite to its preferred direction. Any questions about the procedure? Any questions? Looks like there is a question, no? Uh, no, it seems no. there are no questions. So, <clears throat> so does, um, so, do you think we can think of this as a democracy? Right? So, does everybody see the connection with the democratic voting? No. No. <laughs> no, so... Um, um, each uh, neuron has a preferred vector, W, and then uh, it, it has only one vote, um, you know, zero or one, or one and minus one, and then we add the contribution from each neuron as a W, and we weigh it by its spikes. And as a result, we get a pattern T. So that's, um, that's my connection with the democratic vote. So, 
uh, a neuron produces a spike, and by producing a spike, it pulls the average that will be the final outcome of, um, um, of the neural population towards its preferred direction. So if, um, you know, each neuron is given its preferred W, and then it has a choice, produce a spike or not, and then we um, add them up and, um, uh, and, and get the final vector. So, well, I mean, it, it's not a mathematical statement calling it a democracy, but do, do you agree or you disagree? Or do you, at, uh, at least uh, is the procedure, um, any questions about the procedure? Uh, I think there is a question. Yeah. Hi. Um, one question. So this T is just for one neuron, right? No. It is a joint result across many neurons. So this is um, the population response here, and it's one vector. So you think of it as the final movement um, if we have a brain-machine interface, which says, I'm monitoring our eye, and the person physically cannot move the hand, but then we have another uh, robot, and I read out our eye, and I want to know where does the person think they want to move the hand. Then for each neuron, once I assign the WI, um, I weigh the spikes in a given moment in time, and that gives me the direction where I think the person wants to move the hand. So the brain-machine interfaces are useful in paralyzed uh, people where the, you know, the, the brain is still working, but the, the, neur the, conne the neural connection between the brain and the limb has been cut. So in that case, they, they work by, we monitor the neurons, if, if we can, and then you, you even can fit this WI by asking, for example, the person where they want to move. And once the, the device is um, calibrated, then when a neuron, when the person produces various spikes across the population, then the weights are assigned. This is the sum across neurons and you get a single vector which represents the ex expected movement of the hand. Uh, so in other words, oh. yes? No, no, no sorry, uh, go, go ahead, and I think there was another question later. There was another question, right? Yeah, I think so, right? Yeah, it, it was about the, the WI, so if I got it right, they are fixed uh, by the experiment? and they represent uh, something like, for example, the direction of uh, the movement or something like that? Yes, so the WI are fixed per neuron. Well, let, let's, you know, they can change slowly through adaptation, but um, so the, the WI are fixed per neuron, and then um, you add them up uh, with the weights for, from each neuron to get a neuronal population readout. And uh, so, in other words, the, 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 the relationship between the left and the right-hand side of the slide is as follows. On the right-hand side, we use many observations across time on a single neuron to get its WI. Once we have this information across many neurons, then we can make a prediction at a single time point by average across the population. So on the left, we average across the population at one moment in time. On the right, we average across time to get estimate for one um, neuron. So in other words, this vector T here is um, kind of the, the expected motion. But I can also use this equation. I'm using, you can think that I'm using the same equation on the right-hand side, 
but where T is the actual T and RI are the actual RIs, and then, but the I is over time. And then we do the average to get WI. <laughs> that, that may be more confusing than, um, than clarifying. But uh, please yeah. ask the question. <laughs> um, and uh, such that we, um, we figure it out. OK, thanks. So every time, yeah, every time you ask a question, it, it, it's helpful to, to see um, you know, it's like shining light on an uh, un unknown part um, in the derivation. So anyway, this is the procedure. It was um, in the context of movement, but it actually is um, very ubiquitous and across many, many species and um, different uh, modalities. So instead of uh, motor neurons, you can think of this as visual neurons. In this case, WI will be a preferred visual pattern for a neuron. So I'm monitoring neuron for a long time to get its preferred visual pattern. And then once I repeat this experiment across neurons, and I, set, and I have a set of, say, 100 neurons, for each of them I, I know their preferred visual pattern. Then once I monitor in real time their responses across 100 neurons, I can add their preferred patterns and get an estimate of the stimulus at one moment in time. OK? So any, well, let's try to move on. And then if, uh, if there are questions, then please ask now. No, if not, we will move on. Maybe it will be clear from the next slide. So this is, as you see, this procedure is similar to what we, um, so now a few comments. What we derived was similar to this procedure, except we had another factor beta i here. And this factor beta was the magnitude of this receptive field, because in this case, the, the experimentalist just normalized it to one because all we care about is the direction so of movement. So let's take it as a vector. And, uh, but the mathematical derivation says that the magnitude of the vector has to be scaled by um, a factor that represents the noise. So if you accept that this is kind of a democratic voting, what we are obtaining from information theory is uh, n you know, not purely democratic voting, which is biased now by reliability or experience. So a neuron that is less noisy will get a stronger weight. Okay. But we will go over it in other details. So in other words, um, and remember the, the formula that we derived from information theory is, is very general. It just says I have a logistic function and uh, it, it doesn't, it, it, it should be applicable uh, as widely as this procedure. It doesn't matter whether the neuron is um, visual or auditory, whether it's a motor neuron or it represents some complex decision-making part. So the, this is a general readout. And you can see that empirically, a very similar procedure based on these standard population vectors is very ubiquitous across many species. But the question was raised um, if um, this is the correct procedure, because it makes an assumption that if neurons have the same um, preferred um, direction or preferred pattern WI, then their spikes should be averaged. And this goes against the notion that neural code is very complex, right? If we have n neurons, there are two to the n different response patterns. And they, these patterns, if we are using them, they they have a capacity to convey a lot of information. And if we are just adding neuron, uh, adding spikes, we will be losing information. So 
people were doubtful about this population vector procedure, and they decided to test whether the, um, the key assumption of this population vector. And the key assumption is that if neurons are tuned to the same stimuli, then their responses add. Does everybody see this assumption in this equation? Okay. So, um, um, where does it show up? So if we have WI, if there are two neurons that have the same WI, so W1 equals uh, W2. I think, think Tanya, sorry, there is a the reply here. Sorry. Does it work? Uh, the mic? Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, I lost what is the assumption that we are making. So consider, so this sum is the sum over neurons. Imagine that WI, um, there are two neurons with W1 and W2 that are the same. In that case, if W1 and W2 are the same, then according to this procedure, I can just add spikes R1 and R2 and um, the contribution of these um, neurons to the overall average will be the same. In other words, I can add the spikes of neurons which have the same WI and not lose any information. So we go R, um, R1 plus R2, and it doesn't matter whether, you know, in a combinatorial code, we have uh, zero one one zero as two different patterns, but here it says that R one plus R two is all that matters. So the pattern, say zero one and one zero, has the same total number of spikes across these two neurons, and so they we are losing our channel. We are losing a channel. Um, which says zero, 01 and 10 one as two separate channels, and now we are saying it's the same kind of code word. So with two neurons, we have technically four code words, 00, 10, 01, and 11. So Angel, maybe it's useful to write it on the board for two neurons. Mm, let me write it here. So you said two neurons? Yeah, for, let's consider two neurons. In this mm -hmm. sum, we consider two neurons. And in principle, we have um, four different response patterns. Um, not sure what should... Uh... Maybe you can just draw a table, uh, Angelo. Ah, OK. Neuron one, neuron two, and the sum. So minus one. Yeah, so I can. Ah, OK. I, mean, and I, maybe I, I can, uh, let, let's see. Maybe I have it. Um, I have a table. Let's see, like this. So we can talk about this, but this is kind of. Um, a table, this is for three neurons, and imagine that, so kind of maybe we can look at this table then here. It's a hypothetical table. You have uh, three stimuli, and neuron one responds to stimulus one, neuron two responds to stimulus two, neuron three to stimulus three, and therefore if you um, know which neuron produced a spike, you know exactly which stimulus produces spine. But if I sum spikes across neurons, then the total number of spikes here is 111, 1, 1, 
and so I lost information. So that is um, how much information is conveyed in the population count. So that's kind of a, a similar um, maybe table, but this uh, this example is uh, um, a little bit of a simplification because um, so suppose. Um, In this case, the stimuli has to be along this. So, for to make relationship with our formula, all stimuli have to be um, along the same axis. But I think it hopefully it generally illustrates the point. But going back to our expression, where is it? If uh, if in the neural population you have two neurons that are tuned to the same, say, direction of motion, WI, then in this population vector, you no longer distinguish their, um, the identity of these neurons because you just average. Um, in the sum, we just say, we can say R1 plus R2 times W1, because W1, if W1 and W2 are the same, I just add the spikes from um, these two neurons. And I no longer keep track of which neuron fired and which did not. Yes, questions? Are there questions? Uh, yes, maybe one, uh, Tatiana. OK. Sorry, I just just confirming. Uh, T is normalized or or no? T. Um, thank you for your question. So T is um, um, it doesn't have to be normalized, but um, it is true that it will have a maximum value and. Um, it's an important question that once we go to a more general procedure with beta i, so imagine that the stimuli can go between minus infinity and plus infinity. But in this procedure, w i have unit lengths. And so at most, the lengths of t, even if all w i's point in the same direction, the maximum magnitude will be the number of neurons. So this um, T goes between minus N and N. So I have compressed the stimulus that is, goes between minus infinity to plus infinity to a finite range. And part of that compression is the consequence of the sigmoidal nonlinearity that we have Angela drawn on the board, but now summed across neurons. So it is true that from stimuli to the three out T, there is a nonlinear compression. But what is interesting is that T is a linear function of neural responses. So it is a <clears throat> linear readout. So it's a linear readout, but it gives you a nonlinear non version of the stimulus because neural responses are a nonlinear function of the stimulus. Uh, sorry, we have a, a, a question online. Maybe you, do you see uh, it, or should I read it? Yes, I will see. It. Um, why the information transformed was zero? Oh, okay, in the table. So in the in the table that that is here, um, you have uh, three different stimuli. And the count was the same, right? So in this example, the, if I say that uh, the information between stimuli and the count, 
because the count is the same across all different stimuli, so its entropy is zero, and so the information is zero. Okay? Thank you. All right. So now um, we can talk about um, this assumption. So people um, wanted to test. So the key assumption is that the neurons are tuned to the same stimulus, then their spikes can be average. And um, here is the first study uh, almost yeah, 20 years ago from Jonathan Victor. <clears throat> and this is in the primary visual cortex. And neurons are um, similarly tuned, so their Ws are not identical, but similar because it's from a similar, with tetrodes from a similar part of the cortex. And what these investigators have shown is that the information in uh, the population count was significantly less that information when you pay attention to which neuron produce which spike, so in the labeled line code. And in their discussion, they say that this is an argument that nervous system takes advantage of the complexities of the neural code, of this uh, combinatorial power, but how it does it is not clear because um, you have to keep track of um, neuronal identities um, and potentially uh, have two to the end different response patterns. But now we have a solution that we will be testing in terms of this information preserving readout. So that's one study from Jonathan Victor. And then another study is um, from Bill Bialik and collaborators. They also wanted to test this idea and uh, that's in the population vector, if you have the same tuning, then you can average spikes. So in, that, in this case, they, um, these are earlier experiments. So they make a synthetic population by aligning all neuronal tuning to, to have the same preferred direction and creating a hypothetical representation. So the, the logic has several steps. The experimental design has several steps in it. So in reality, these neurons are tuned to various directions. But we can measure how this neuron responds to stimuli that are offset by a certain amount from its preferred direction. So we get this tuning curve. And then we can place and create a synthetic population of how the neurons, these neurons would respond if um, for, a given for, a, for a given real stimulus. So it, it says, well, I, record, uh, I recorded these neurons separately, but I imagine that um, how this population would respond to a motion of, um, um, to the actual motion that was displaced from relative from its preferred directions. And so in this case, one can have different neurons this way, time that way, and one can compare the information transmitted if we just monitor the sums uh, the sound activity of this neural population, and that's in counts, or keeping track of which neuron produces spike. And you can see that you get many, much more information in the words, which is combinatorial code compared to counts. All right. So we have a question from, oh, that's an answer. Okay. Uh, I tried to answer. Uh... <laughs> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, this is, I would say, a more direct test, but also was um, um, had several steps because the population is synthetic. And in those days, it was hard to record many neurons at the same time. So they imagined that for 
each neuron, real neuron with a given research, uh, with a given direction, you, um, that was recorded, there's another neuron with uh, the, the preferred direction that we need. And so we shift the stimuli and assign the responses relative to that preferred direction. Okay. So then, um, but now we have a solution, right? And even in the discussion of uh, Leslie Osborne and Bill Dalek's paper, they said, well, how could this be? And uh, one possibility is that if, um, you know, these neurons, they have the same peak response rate, they have the same preferred stimulus, and yet the identity of the neurons matter for the purpose of characterizing the stimulus. And you can imagine that one way it could matter is that if you have a, a stimulus that is somewhere on the flank of the curve, then if the narrow-tuned neuron did not respond, but the broadly-tuned neuron did respond, then that will help us say, oh, so narrow down the range where the stimulus could have um, happened. And so by, even though these neurons have the same direction and the same peak magnitude, they have different tuning widths. And because they have different tuning widths, if we take that into account, that carries information about um, the stimulus that is ignored if we just add those spikes in. But now the claim is, from our information preserving procedure, is that there is actually a linear way to take the, this um, um, into account. So how, uh, how can we get there? So most of the studies of um, population decoding are based on these tuning curves. So you plot the spike probability as a function of deviation between the stimulus and uh, research um, uh, from the preferred direction. Now there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between this curve, uh, a tuning curve, which is shown here, and parameters of our logistic nonlinearity. This is called linear nonlinear model. It's, uh, the reason it's called linear nonlinear model is because you have the actual stimulus kind of a pattern, you project it onto the dominant uh, preferred pattern, so this is our vector w, and that goes on the x-axis. And then the probability of a spike is this nonlinear function, and it has two parameters, the threshold and how fast it rises, so one, one over beta. And using these two parameters, you can, when you vary them, you can vary the orientation tuning curve. So for some reason, when people talk about encoding, meaning how the stimuli I converted into spikes, people usually work with this, with this formulation, linear nonlinear model. Because the stimuli can be complex, they're not necessarily described by one parameter, such as orientation, so then the linear nonlinear model is, is more useful description. But for the decoding, people said, well, it's, um, I'm not sure how to put that. Um, let's simplify the picture and let's work in the context of the tuning curve. So this is fine because there is a one-to-one -one relationship between parameters. But the claim is that mathematics is much simpler in, the, in this LN formulation in terms of parameters alpha and beta rather than parameters of the tuning curves. So for example, um, to illustrate this relationship between 
parameters of the Ellen model and tuning curves, <clears throat> we can discuss that when beta is decreased, so the tuning curve becomes, the, the nonlinearity becomes more shallow, then the tuning curve um, kind of simultaneously is squashed and broadened. And if you change the threshold, then uh, the peak will decrease, uh, but the tuning will change somewhat, but not, um, but not as strongly. So in other words, when I change the parameter threshold and gain in this, um, in this formulation, I can, there is a family of tuning curves that one can obtain on the right. So, but advantage of this formulation is that the, um, I have a simple information preserving population factor. Here, the beta and alpha are related to the difference between the peak and the trough, and they're related to this width, but you have to take the logarithm of the curve near the peak and take a second derivative, and that will be something similar to beta. So mathematical formula is, is, is more complicated. And therefore, if I want to derive the information preserving um, function from tuning curves, I, I would say it's Im impossible um, from tuning curve, but it's very easy from this LN formulation. So now um, some intuition for how, so the claim is that we can take a linear function of neural responses and uh, capture all information that there is in the neural population, because that's a definition of a sufficient statistic. So let's see how it works with two neurons. So suppose I'm trying to encode stimuli in a two-dimensional plane, and the two neurons have their preferred directions, W1 and W2. <clears throat> yes? Is that, is that a question? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. So the two neurons have uh, four different patterns. Zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, and one, one. So these are four different patterns. And on this two-dimensional plane, they're represented as four dots. There are still four values of a single two-dimensional vector. So far, we haven't simplified a lot. But imagine that you now have three neurons and then many more neurons. So first I'm adding the third neuron and it's not spiking. So we get the same um, four values. And then, um, and then we add a third neuron. And now when it spikes, um, this is a pair of um, a zero, zero, 001, and then the whole procedure is shifted. Sorry. No. So sorry, there is some noise. Have... Sorry. Sorry? It's, uh, you know, San Diego, we have airplanes. Uh, today have to be outside, so we have to wait for the... Ah, okay. <laughs> it's not our fault. Yes, uh, you know... The, it can be assured that our military is working to protect us. So. <laughs> Look like uh, alien invasion. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I am from Kiev, so I'm very distracted by the oh. current. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. So, <clears throat> um, so in, in this case, um, so with three neurons, we have eight possible patterns of um, uh, that the population of three neurons can produce. So technically, it can be a very complicated function. But now the claim is that 
it, it's not there is a geometry and and, and um, geometry in this space meaning instead of saying that this is an arbitrary function of um, you know arbitrary eight patterns these eight patterns can be encoded as eight values of a two-dimensional vector if um, kind of receptive fields of neurons live in a 2D plane. So I'm doing a projection from two to the uh, three, eight patterns to eight values of the vector. And uh, um, now um, imagine you have N neurons. And, but the job of these neurons is to encode position in a 2D plane. So I will wait for the, for the clear skies. So with uh, N neurons, we have two to the N values, but they still live in a 2D plane. And so this is two to the n values of a single uh, of a single two-dimensional vector. And you can see now how and the claim is when I monitor that vector, so when the neurons, various combinations of spiking and not spiking of these neurons will give you one of these values. Mm -hmm. And the advantage of this geometric so we have converted what was an information theory and pattern problem to a, a geometry problem where the readout is a vector and it has continuity and topography to it because when um, the stimulus changes, the, even if there is noise in neural responses, this vector will um, will move among the nearby values. And so if I don't want to monitor all to the two to the n values, I can coarse grain my um, available space to the number of patterns. <laughs> that, um, that I can monitor. And, um, and in this way, capture most of the information, but with a smaller, you know, not necessarily monitoring two to the end values. I feel it's a good time to ask for questions. Any question? Uh, yes, one, uh, Tatiana. Uh, how do you place the position of the possible values on the plane? I mean, it's, it's at random or uniformly distributed? So it depends. So these uh, points, the possible points are determined by uh, Ws. So in this case, if you have three neurons and they have these vectors, then um, the three basis vectors, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, then they will determine the eight possible patterns that you can have. Now, um, the question is how to set and you will have freedom for setting these Ws in a way to maximize information. So in particular, um, the derivations that we went over about how to code multidimensional inputs and how to filter them speak, um, but I will wait a little bit.
So, um, which neur so there was a question in the chat about which neurons to uh, include in the population. So include all neurons that are, um, that you measure. So the more neurons you have, the, the greater the accuracy, the, the, the greater is the number of possible values. So if I only have three neurons, I can distinguish, so the stimuli are encoded in the values, in the eight values. But if I have many neurons, like this, then um, I will be able to distinguish stimuli that are closer because I have higher um, number of values about um, um, uh, possible values with which stimuli can be encoded. So I have another simulation uh, illustration about the difference between information preserving and classic population vector. And then maybe we will um, ask for questions. So imagine that you have again three neurons, but now these two neurons have the same direction, but they have different noise values. In that case, you have um, in the information preserving version, because these vectors have different lengths, the patterns uh, of spiking will be different, whether the first neuron is spiking or the third neuron is spiking. Mm -hmm. And so we have our eight patterns. But in the classic population um, vector prescription, all the vectors are normalized. So when you add on uh, these vectors, you have 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, and same thing on the other axis. So instead of um, eight response patterns, you have six response patterns. So now I think um, the um, questions. So that's the connection between information theory to geometry. We say that information theory says patterns and we sum over possible patterns. And the claim is that if um, you have this uh, minimalistic model of neural responses where the patterns are based on a linear projection between the stimulus and response pass through a nonlinearity, then you can convert these patterns th there um, to a continuous kind of topographic mapping um, where the position of uh, the the neural responses are mapped as a discrete set of points but on a continuous map. Somebody has to ask a question. So maybe I, I will ask the question. So okay. what you are saying is that essentially by having different uh, betas, you uh, allow the, I mean, the neural response uh, to have a, a, a metric, essentially, to have a, a, a sense of, uh, say, which stimulus are close to, to which one, essentially. Yes. So um, by having different betas, um, we, we are not losing. So you, you see that if you ignore beta, you, you will capture qualitative features of decoding, the patterns will be similar, but some of the symbols will be merged. So that explains why uh, when you look in the detail, as in Bill Bialik's paper or Jonathan Victor's paper, when, um, um, when we ignore the noisiness or the differences in reliability among neurons, then information is lost. But at the same time, you can understand that this procedure is 
kind of um, robust and why the standard population vector um, generally works. Um, but I think also the, the theoretical advantage is that it also shows that, um, well, we will go over maybe with additional examples how the nonlinearity, um, how all the diversity in the tuning curves can be summarized with just one extra parameter. So maybe that's. Um, okay, thanks. All right, so then we can test this. So another one is um, that more reliable responses should be weighted more strongly and no other information is necessary for the readout. For example, the threshold <coughs> do not contribute. Now, the thresholds will affect, just like there was a question, how should the W be chosen? Depending on how we choose the W, we'll, uh, we'll determine how much information that particular population can capture, but um, once it's, the information is there, uh, you, it doesn't affect the readout. Same thing with the threshold. The, the, if I carefully position the threshold, which was the topic of a few lectures back, then that determines whether the neurons will um, convey more or less information. But once the thresholds are there, I don't need to know them to read out the inform to, to capture full information. So here is an illustration for um, addressing this uh, question that was raised um, in the Leslie Osborne and Bill Galex paper, that if you have a population with the same preferred direction, same peak response, but different tuning curves, widths, and in this case, these um, different differences in tuning were differences um, to um, in beta factors. So in this case, when you compute information, <clears throat> so the black line is full information, red line is information preserving population vector, and this is the classic population vector here in gray that only um, sums the responses. And in this case, the W is the same for all neurons, so you can actually ignore it. So in reality, it's population count and information preserving weighted population count. So even though these are two scalar quantities, one is the population count, is a scalar quantity, and the other one is information preserving population count, also a scalar quantity, but is weighted differently and it takes more values. And so you can have um, um, capture more information. So that explains the intuition behind the Bill Balix observation here, saying that if once you take into account the different widths, you should be able to capture more information. But it also tells you how, that with just one single weighted parameter. So that's one um, illustration. And then another one is, um, um, here, um, In this case, you, you can have tuning curves, again, by the same, um, same preferred direction, but um, they, they have different peaks and they have different widths. But these differences are induced by changes in the thresholds, but not changes in the beta parameters. And in this case, the classic population vector is perfectly sufficient. Okay, so I'm thinking that we can make take a small break and uh, uh, of a, you know, maybe five minutes and then
continue the discussion. Would that, okay. would that be good? Do you agree? Okay. okay. If, uh, maybe Can after you five minutes you will reconvene here. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, if just... Everybody is uh, back? Uh, not yeah. really. <laughs> just, no. Sorry, I just called the others. Eh, ragazzi, qualcuno può andare a chiamare gli altri? Recording stopped. This one, um, this simulation argues that you can have some variability in the tuning curves, as in the peak and the width, and actually ignore it for the purpose of redown. So not all variability in the tuning curve matters. On the other hand, um, if you have neurons that have um, now different preferred stimuli, so different vectors W, but if they are paired up, then if now if all neurons have the same W, uh, different Ws, so different directions, then technically it doesn't matter if they have the same betas or not, because they, uh, when you add them up in different combinations, then it will produce different uh, possible patterns, and so there will be no information loss. But um, because these uh, preferred stimuli are not, the knowledge of the preferred direction itself uh, has some uncertainty in it, so then um, there will be loss in practice. So uh, in this case, we are modeling a uh, situation where um, you have two subpopulations, each uh, both uh, that are tuned to different uh, preferred stimuli, and they have a different tuning curve width. And then again, there is a difference between a classic population vector and information preserving population vector. And you can capture back that difference by just, um, you know, you can capture full information just by taking the beta factors into account. So we talked about this graph. And another interesting uh, part here um, that I didn't talk about is that the dots here, the dots is a slightly different calculation than the line. The line is the full information in whatever the response patterns you, you get by taking different combinations. The dots is binning these response patterns into 15 bins. It means that, just like in this case um, of, say, two to the n responses, yes, technically, I'm supposed to capture full information. I have to keep track of which of these, um, which of these possible um, patterns the population vector landed it on each trial. But imagine you can now grade it into a, a coarser grid and ignore different, so merge these two similar um, possible response patterns into one. And the observation is that this leads to a minimal loss of information. Okay. So um, another point that I think was raised, um, Matteo asked at the end of the previous lecture, what about correlations in neural responses? So in this case, um, the, 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 the so-called noise correlations, meaning the direct links between neural responses. And um, so we have um, neurons that um, their responses will be fluctuating together uh, for a given stimulus because of the direct uh, or indirect links between, between them. And it turns out that based on our definition of this sufficient statistic, if you can write the joint distribution of neural responses given the stimulus in this form, meaning a function of the stimulus, a function of response, and then this form which we had before, which is the coupling between stimuli and T here has neural responses, plus the correlation term. So if the correlation term is stimulus independent, 
even though it affects the overall amount of information in neural responses, but you can read out what is there without uh, taking that into account. So the, I think uh, a use, exciting aspect of this um, readout is that um, you can use the same readout when noise correlations go up and down, and, um, but, but, not, but within a current ensemble, they, they have to stay constant. Tatiana, sorry, may I ask you a question? Yes. Uh, why in this uh, GIJ matrix we have this uh, uh, denominator 10 square root of n? Oh, oh yeah, so this is, you know, you can put, uh, this is just for a simulation, so this goes... Um, okay. So this one, um, um, one has to separate the general from the specific. This okay. is the general formula. Sure. For where this sure. population works, mm -hmm. and this GIJ was a specific to this simulation. I see. We had to choose something for our population. I think of uh, say ten neurons or something like this. I see. But um, and what is also interesting and worth mentioning is that once you put these noise correlations in, you know what the the tuning curves get um, all kinds of weird shapes. Mm -hmm. So this is another example for how the tuning curve description isn't um, obscures uh, kind of obscures the, the the math. Okay. So you know once I have these tuning curves, how do I get out the relevant parameter beta that is hidden in there? So if instead of plotting as a JJ, I plot as an LN model then I measure those parameters directly in the experiment and, um, you know, and, and then we have a direct description. So you will see papers in the literature that say that diversity of the tuning curve matters. And it's true, but not all diversity. And how to get out the relevant parameters of the tuning curves is, is not clear here. So all we could say if I'm working with tuning curves is that, um, you know, it all matters. The peak matters and the width matters and the position matters and then, you know, the wiggles matter. But once you transform to LN model, you can say, well, actually, um, it's only this noise parameter beta that matters. So that's my... So now, for now on, it was all about uh, model responses, and now the test on real neural responses. So this is the data, same data as I talked about, uh, that I recorded, and same data uh, from the primary visual cortex. But in addition to probing natural scenes and white noise, we also recorded ratings. And so we are now computing information about gradings and you can compute full information because this is a small number of neurons recorded simultaneously in black and the classic population vector is in gray and it loses information compared to the full information because uh, it, it merges these patterns together and the spike count uh, but it's better than the complete spike count because the Ws are not exactly the same. <clears throat> okay, so, and maybe looking under the hood of this calculation, uh, this is on the left is information preserving uh, calculation, on the right is a classic population vector, and each, cal uh, each dot is uh, the population vector for a given stimulus, but color denotes the same stimuli. So you can see that the relative, um, the scales are different, and uh, there is more scatter in the classic population vector or more mixing between patterns compared to uh, information preserving population vector. Okay. Any questions about this calculation? Any question? Mm, no. 
No. Okay. So another question that I sometimes get here is that in the LN model, we, we changed two parameters, threshold and the gain. And as a result, by changing the parameters, you can change the tuning curves in some way. But you will be limited. You cannot create an arbitrary a tuning curve, although unless we start adding noise correlations. So if you look, and in particular, when we change these two parameters, alpha and beta, um, there is a correlation, kind of a constraint between the minimum firing rate here and what they call modulation of the tuning curve, which is the maximum, the difference between maximum and minimum. So as the threshold decreases, I span the curves this way. And as I change beta, I also kind of, but there isn't, basically, if, if you have large a minimum, then I uh, then there is a smaller kind of room that I can go in terms of the maximum. So it turns out that there is some evidence for this from neural populations that, in particular, that neurons with strong multiplicative effect have weak additive effectors, or, or and vice versa. So that's an indirect evidence that the variability in the real tuning curve is consistent with the variability that um, you would observe by changing the, only the two parameters, alpha and <coughs> okay. So in other words, so we can now summarize um, that I gave you the intuition about the claim is that neural responses can be read out without information loss. And now the plan was to apply this formula for large neural populations and then a comparison with a retinal arrays. So what is interesting is, so the advantage of this function is that we have an, a prescription that we are deriving a population vector T that has the same dimensionality as the set of receptive fields, which often equals the stimulus dimensionality S, because that's how we um, probe them. And so, in a way, we solve these uh, curves of dimensionality in terms of the number of neurons. But what remains is the dimensionality um, the curse of dimensionality in terms of the stimulus. So we say that it's a full information between S and T, but that can still in practice be a, a complicated calculation if uh, S is um, uh, itself high dimensional. So any, any questions about this? So, given the time, I will summarize some answers, and then we will go through the mathematics in, in more detail on the next lecture. So, we will go from this slide. So, this is our full information between vector S and vector T. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, and, Pardi, I have a question. If yes. I, if I, so in many cases, uh, uh, I mean, is the dimensionality of the stimulus uh, always known? I mean, in the sense that um, there are some neurons that maybe are responding to something that we don't know. Uh, and, and so, uh, or are you only considering cases where somehow this is uh, this is known uh, a priori? 
No, it's um, not known, but um, it, it is known the moment I say I want to compute information about a given thing. So if I suppose these neurons are conveying information about visual and auditory stimuli. But I ignore the auditory and I only measure visual. So then I specified the stimulus. It's going to be a visual stimulus. I measure their receptive fields with respect to the visual component. So the auditory component is averaged out. And then we are reading out. So the neural responses will have information about visual and auditory part. But if I am computing information about visual part, I can read out that information using this equation. So in other words, you know, mutual information, it's a mutual information. So um, the so the moment I say, I want to read out, so the, the neural responses have information about visual and auditory signal. I said, I want to read out information between visual stimuli and these neural responses. And I can do that using this procedure, where S and then um, the uh, population vector, which is a visual one determined by their visual parts of their place field, the uh, receptive field. Okay, so, so uh, clearly the dimensionality of the uh, vector T is the same as the dimensionality of the stimulus, right? Because you yes. identify it with these uh, tuning curves with the W's, essentially. Yes, because uh, I'm using the stimulus to measure the um, receptive fields. So, in principle, the receptive field can be more complicated, but to the extent to which I measured it, uh, the, the set of the, yeah, that, that, that's, the, yeah, but, you know, what I, uh, I hope to have conveyed today is um, the, you know, I, I think it's an interesting result that you go from arbitrary two to the n patterns to a specific prescription of uh, what to do um, with these neural responses. Yes, thanks. And well, uh, then uh, well, another question. Um, so these are uh, essentially, if I remember well, well, does, does it this depends on uh, your assumption of a linear response of the neurons? Uh, I mean, your equation for T, uh, I mean, it was... Uh, so, the key assumption is um, this one. So, um, that it has to be a logistic function. If it is not a logistic function, we do not have information preserving population vector. Um, if it approximates the logistic function, then we will be approximately correct. And then the key assumption here is that um, we have S times W. Now, you can relax that, but then the definition of the information preserving population vector, if it is not a linear function, then you have to put this nonlinear function here. Okay, thanks. Okay, so now we want um, to talk about um, what to do with high dimensional stimuli. And, you know, for high dimension, it is um, so we're going to skip a lot of math because we only have a few minutes and we'll go over it next time. But I will just give an introduction to the math. And the introduction is based on, so we want to compute this information between S and T. So if S is one dimensional, T will be one dimensional. That's okay. So information between two 
analog variables. If I have S is 10 dimensional and T is 10 dimensional, it's already problematic because um, like, um, you know, if I use 10 bins for each dimension, so it will be 10 to the 10 for the stimulus and 10 to the 10 for T. So we can do some approximation and one of them is the so-called chain rule of information, which I, I think if um, students have seen it. Um, it. And for now, we leave the T as a vector and we evaluate this component by component. So the chain rule says it's information between vector T and component one plus information between T and component two conditional on one, plus information between T and component three, conditional on the component one and two, and so on. So uh, this is a little bit of a simplification, but this um, higher order, this conditional information that depends on many, many uh, other components will be difficult to do. So we will be ignoring some terms or kind of doing curse graining or renormalization group approaches to approximate these terms. I think so. And then I will go over these three approximations. And maybe this will be an introduction to the next lecture. So the full information can be written as a sum of um, various conditional information terms, but they can be simplified. So if inputs are isotropic, it turns out that it's only component, so maybe I go in the opposite order. If inputs are independent, then you can approximate this as information between one component and component of vector t and then S2, a component T2, so component by component. Then one can add, um, for more accuracy, conditioning upon the previous components. And if um, we have a isotropic symmetry in the problem, then technically it's um, two-dimensional information between S and T plus the magnitude of the rest of the component. <coughs> and then we will be evaluating this approximation next time. So maybe I stop here and I will thank you for your attention and ask for questions if there are any questions. Questions? Yeah, uh, yes, there is one, uh, Tatiana. Okay. Sorry, one second. Uh, uh, sorry, it's not actually related to the lecture, but more to the exam. I just wanted to know uh, how it's going to be done. I mean, how it's going to be about what's the method we'll be used for the exam. So I think we, um, it will be a multi, multiple choice uh, uh, set of questions. And um, that, that's as much as I know at this point. And be based on the lectures. So that's. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. Further mm -hmm. questions? Uh, maybe not. Ah, uh, no, there is one. Tatiana, yeah, sorry. One. Uh, just two slides ago, you mentioned the uh, exponential property of the model, which simplifies the, um, the information. Can you please explain, explain it? Okay. So, um, just a second, yes. Mm -hmm. 
So last lecture we talked about um, sufficient statistic and this was our model. And once you have this model here, um, so in, in other words, you can rewrite this as um, e to the um, kind of two, um, e to the fc times some denominator that does not depend on r. And from this uh, follows um, this expression here, if you can see my cursor. And so in order to have this exponential form, we need to have to have a logistic function. And once you have this exponential form, you, this is a probability, joint probability distribution between stimuli and R. So this is independent of R, and we have some other parts that are independent of S. So the only coupling between stimuli and responses is this term. And therefore, this is the um, this information preserving statistic. Okay, so if we do not have the logistic form, we do not have the the, the readout. Mm. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, by the way. Yes, uh, I know. I, I wanted uh, to clean them up. <laughs> the so, lecture. Uh, so. But, but I will upload the lecture notes um, oh. as is, but I wanted to clean them up a little bit with, um, um, with those typos that were noticed. So that, that's why I, I was delayed. Okay. okay. So Tanya, uh, just on this slide, I mean, I think uh, that uh, if your input, uh, if your R is binary, you yes. can always write uh, uh, the probability in this way. Thank you. Because it's essentially, um, uh, I mean, it, it can all, uh, I mean, there is only one free parameter. Uh, and, and so I think you can always write it in this way. Um, okay, maybe uh, I will think about it. I, I thought that if I, if I have a sigmoidal tuning, but not a logistic tuning, I, will, I thought I would have difficulties in writing it in the pure exponential. So if I take it as an integral of a, a Gaussian distribution as an error function, I, I was worried that... Um, no, because it, is, essentially the R is just two values, R equal plus one and minus one. So there is only one number that you have to... And actually they are related by the normalization condition. So it's only one number and it's a function of the stimulus, so you can always write it in this form. Um, uh, what, what about if it is a kind of an error function? Um, Do you yeah. think I can multiply and expansi exponentiate? Um, if it what? is some other function and the I exponentiate, um, Rn times uh, some function of the stimulus for a binary stimulus, I could write it as exponential to Rn times the logarithm of that function. Uh, well, so yes, yeah, so so if, if you have a binary variable uh, uh, and the probability that the binary variable is uh, is one is p you can always write the probability of the binary variable r as uh, p to the r times 1 minus p to the 1 minus r if uh, or, or, or to the to the but i mean okay. the... yes i think that that the, the yeah okay I, I i think i agree mm. so yeah. okay. it, so as long as the, if you think it's binary and then i can write it as e to the r logarithm of my function. Exactly, exactly. yes, exactly. Okay. Thank you, Matthew. Okay. More questions, observations? So 
So if not, let's thank uh, Tatiana again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.